waiting for Alela to go live. Yeah, since you're following me, we're already live. Fresh Cafe. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August edition of Civil Cafe. Uh, I'm Gene Park, from community manager for uh, CivilBeat.com, uh, Hawaii investigative news service. Uh, we uh, are a monthly subscription service, and every month we put together uh, these live events to talk about issues uh, that affect our community. Um, this month we're going to be talking about homelessness. Uh, and I guess this leads to my first question, what the heck happened? over these last two decades to increase the homeless population. And if I could, I'd like to start with uh, Colin from the, uh, the state's perspective. Aloha, all of you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I also want to thank Yo, and I uh, want you to please remember them, uh, Holly Keefer and the programs that they run. So the question is, you know, we've got a lot more. We, we noticed that there are more homeless people the reality is that homeless people have been here for many years. The situation that you described presently is one that has been growing. And it is now to the point where people are recognizing it. And you know, when you start to think about things like that, I see that as an opportunity. An opportunity to make change happen. And here's the change that needs to happen. I'm going to be brief and really succinct. What we need to do is focus on getting people into permanent housing. Now you say, we don't have enough housing. Well, that's true. But until you could start to get people ready to go into it, until you could say that we are going to qualify people to move into housing, and that all of our resources are going to come to bear to be able to move those people into housing, what we are doing is we're simply creating a system where we're using the fact that we can say they're not ready to be housed as a reason to say that we do not have a crisis of huge proportions. And so the work that we're doing is to really change that conversation. And it's one about creating permanent housing. We've created an initiative to do that for the first time. We are using a, a standard assessment tool so that we can begin to triage and understand who are the people who are the neediest. And if you were talking about the 90s, I can tell you what the data that we're collecting is finding. For the first time, all of our service providers are using one tool, because previously, if you had asked different service providers to, decide, to tell you who was the most needy, they all would have their own scales. They all would have their own, their own assessment processes. But now we have one. And the reason that's important is this, because we want to be able to begin to be able to triage the people, to be able to understand what the needs of each different group is, so that we can start to assess the services that are available for them. Well, let me just uh, push you on that a little bit. Feel free to jump in our other panelists. Last time I checked, the, uh, the average price of a home in Honolulu, Honolulu, was $700,000. Is that the figure right now? And the average rent between $1,000 and $1,500, which is just astounding to think about that people survive. Uh, how on earth are we going to have affordable housing? We're right here in Kaka'ako, and the only affordable housing I can think of is Halekavila. But you have all these other luxury places going up with very little allocation for right. affordable housing. So when we say affordable housing, what do we really mean? What is realistic? I want to off show here. John, let's go to John. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on this. We have um, a big long wait list public housing, huge waiting lists and, and the affordable rental housing developments. And there's really nothing between those rental affordable housing and the market. That difference is so great that we see these huge wait lists in our public housing for 10 years, 10,000 people on wait lists. We have hundreds of thousands of people on other other private developer wait lists um, for those Catholic charities or DA housing providers. These groups that actually build uh, they have large weightless because we just don't have a supply on And naturally part of the obvious answer that most of us in this room have has to do with housing and the cost of housing. That's part of the answer to your question. And it's ironic that we're sitting in Kaka'ako having this discussion because Kaka'ako has pretty much been the crucible of this discussion on Oahu 
as we're anticipating lots of uh, housing units going in right here in this particular area, and all the consciousness raising that's been done around the fact that nobody can afford those affordable units. What I can tell you about the families who live at IHS, 80% uh, of the families who live in our family dorm, so our family dorm can hold between 30 and 40 families, which is typically about 130 or 140 folks, 80% of those families are working families. So the most compelling reason for them to be in our shelter is that they simply cannot afford the cost of housing. They have some income, some are working families, some have a fixed income of SSI, welfare, uh, social security retirement, but they can't afford the market rent rentals that's out there in our communities. For example, for a studio, when I have my case workers, uh, case managers, and housing specialists looking for a place for our families and, and singles, most of the prices out there are 1000 1200 1500 for a studio or a one bedroom. And many of our families and individuals at our shelter are earning less than what the actual market rentals are in our community. Right. So if they can't afford, if they don't even make the minimum rent, then they're, they're gonna end up staying in our shelters and that's why there's a, a wait list to get into next step. That's why individuals and family end up staying in our shelter for six months, a year, sometimes two years because they're waiting to get into public housing. They're waiting for their name to get called uh, at those private affordable uh, rental properties. And, and really the challenge is, is the actual price of, of the rentals. Hmm, Jason, you wanna yes. jump in on this? So the, I'm using the word criminalizing, but that's what folks like Hafen Gian and, 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 and... Can I ask a question? No, you can't. And Larry Geller as well. The today. Right. There's right. a bathroom right there. <laughs> Thank if you wait till 7 o'clock, we will have open questions, I promise. Go ahead, Jason. Well, what we're seeing when the police confiscate our clients' uh, belongings is our clients then are pushed back or are taken a couple steps backwards. That's right. Yes. Meaning yeah. their yes. IDs yes. are taken, right. their birth certificates are taken, their social security cards are taken, and do you guys know how long it takes to get a birth certificate Without from another yet. state? Do you know how difficult it is to get another social security card if you don't have an ID? Yep. It's nearly impossible. So what's happening is when, when law enforcement so happen takes a homeless person's belongings, their life just becomes a lot more difficult than yep. it already is. Yes, thank you. And they're already going through a lot, it's, it's not easy being homeless. And, and some of the IDs and documents that our, our clients have, service providers like Waikiki Health, like the Caravan Program, they help those individuals with obtaining those documents. So now that person has to go back to Caravan to ask them to obtain another birth certificate from Montana, which could be difficult to even get a hold of someone at the office, and who knows how long they're gonna get the new birth certificate, which means they won't be able to get their welfare or even be eligible for housing, because now all those documents that you need for housing is gone. So they're, they're back five, ten steps. I, I really want to clear this misconception that um, the enforcement team goes out and looks to confiscate people's IDs. They do. There is a process that they go through where they allow the individuals to go in and get their IDs and their medication and their basic necessities. That is the process no, of No, not no, happening that I promise, way. I swear to God they don't do that. We're hearing from folks in the audience saying that that's not the case, that, and we have actually reported, so will be more than anecdotal evidence that IDs have been confiscated, and it's been very difficult to get that back. Would you not acknowledge at least that it is happening? I know you don't represent HPD, but... And it's not HPD that does it. 
Who does that? It's uh, it's through our enforcement team in the department. DFM stands for? Department of Facility Maintenance. Okay. There's supposed to be so fixing potholes. I'm now going to turn the mic over to uh, Gene Park for questions from the audience. I have to go to PBS Hawaii and be on TV at 8 o'clock. So thank you all very much. Gene, you ready? Yeah. Here you go. This is Captain G.I., uh, former Congressional Cabinet and Park Advocate for Homeless. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you all being here, and um, um, i just like to say, as a service provider, more needs to be done. You all are doing excellent jobs in your own areas, but there is a vernacular here, and I wish Chad were, were still here, that degrades the houseless people and displaced families that are here in the audience. You talked about them being from the mainland and dirty. Uh, violent, mentally ill, drug addicted, and that is not descriptive of right. the entire population. Right. Jerry, you said that 40% of IHS is from the mainland at any given time, and you may be correct, but it's not indicative of the entire population. Right. In fact, 11% are newly from the mainland. So your statistic is not comprehensive. And I'd just like to dispel that myth. Okay, There are a lot of myths that just came out what you're doing with Housing First is great, but the city hasn't offered the full funding for operational costs, so it can't be fully implemented. It can't. And yet you all, except for you, Jason, thank God, you're the only person I've actually seen in Kaka'ako helping the homeless. You still support laws that criminalize, not disincentivize, criminalize those who have nothing. And you reject the fact that their IDs are taken, with the exception of you, Jason, thank you. Further, you don't talk to these people. You have participated in their dehumanization, which is wrong. And I know each and every one of you are doing good things and are good people right down when you get down to it. But politics is not, does not supersede the will and the morality of our community. Hear from these people. Listen to them. Do not criminalize them. The city council is going to hear all of the bills all over again on the 28th. Please do not do that. Criminalization, sit and lie, and the defecation bills do not work. They will increase the, the longevity of their homelessness. We have given you reports. We have given you testimony over testimony, peer-reviewed facts, studies already done in other cities of what works and what doesn't work, and categorically, hold on, categorically, they say in other cities who have already made the same mistake that criminalizing these poor people, criminalizing poverty does not work. And I didn't care if it's like one district or island-wide. It is wrong. And there's no way you can explain that. And as service providers, if you support criminalization, what does it tell the people that you're trying to help? That is why they are so angry. That is why they question your morality. That is why they think you are full of it. Yep. So give them a chance. Prove them wrong. Thank you. Yeah. I live out in Kakaku with my family on a sidewalk. Um, I've been there for a year now. We've gone from being homeless to liabilities to trespassers, now criminals. Uh, what's next, trash? You know, it's like we have a lot of families out there. Right. And we try our best to stay as a community, you know, because we understand that we need to, you know, we need to keep our pride up to get back off the street. Um, this compassionate disruption you guys do, they hurt us so much. I understand from listening to you guys, you guys don't know what goes on when these sweeps happen. Uh, nobody wants to go buy their stuff back because it's all broken. They have to get all your stuff into a green bin. And the only way they're gonna do that is break it. Okay. Why are we gonna pay $200 to go get that 10 poles that's broke, you know? Right. Whatever else, computers, laptops, all that stuff, broken. Personal items, rip. And um, do you think that Bill 7 condones theft from the city? 13-8.
revised seven, ordinances um, of Honolulu. Is the, is the, what, allow, what allows uh, them to do the sweeps and to take things from people. And uh, it was my impression that when you take things that don't belong to you, that's theft. So do you think that Bill 7 condones theft? I, I can't speak to that. Well, that's what you use. You were on a Bill 7 raid. I got video of you at, on a midnight raid taking stuff from the homeless. I've got video of you at uh, hearing, okay, okay, Doug, testifying okay. for the criminalization oh, of the right, homeless. Doug, turn, Doug. Oh, shit, that's stealing. Yeah, Fuck. That was all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Andrea, please. Aloha. I'm Andrea DeCosta. I just wanted to apologize for interrupting earlier. I know that you actually have a format, but my concern was the same as Catherine's. Jerry, you are outstanding. I just, I so aloha you. I appreciate everything that IHS does and what you do for the community. But we all need to be honest about these statistics. And the reason why is because folks like Colin Kippen are going to go around town and talk to publishers and tell publishers that, and share with them the statistics that you're sharing. Your statistics are specific to your facility, and your facility is outstanding. I wish we had more facilities like yours. We could have a bunch of them in every community. That would be great. But the population that you're referring to was 1% of the total popula uh, homeless population in terms of those homeless people from outside of Hawaii. So I just want to be clear about that. 25% of point in time uh, counts are only one snapshot, one evening, one few hours. The total number of homeless people is actually closer to about 14,000 people, okay? So, so over and above the 350 people that you service and the 40% of that, which is about 1% uh, of the total population, there still is 99% uh, of the population that actually originated here. One of the concerns that I have is that Mr. Kippen has um, been using those statistics, the point in time statistics, and your statistics to quote to publishers and suggest to publishers that 50% of the homeless population, the problem is vet. That is not true. 25% of the homeless population are Kanaka Maoli, they're Native Hawaiians. They are from here, they are born here, raised here, most of them, and they deserve a whole lot better. And the second, the second largest population is Caucasian males. That, that doesn't necessarily say where they're from, but we have a lot of Caucasian males who are born and raised here in Hawaii who do find themselves homeless. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on those topics, and that's the reason why I intervene inappropriately, and I apologize to you and to everyone else today. And I want to thank you, Jerry. So the question that I, that I have to ask, two questions, two part question. First part question really is a follow up to the gentleman who was speaking earlier. I know he didn't have a question and it was really rude of you to tell him to shut up or to, to stop it because that was not your place to tell him, okay? So as a follow up to that, he asked if anyone had lost their dignity for a month. I know because I have been a military dependent and I PCS so many times during my adult life that for that period of time when we're PCSing, even though we have the support of the, middle, the federal government and we know we're going to get a house, for that, even for that two or three week period of time when I'm without a house, it drives me crazy because it makes me feel extremely insecure and all I do is drive around looking at everybody in their homes thinking I can't wait till I have a home. So my question to the panel is, following up on this gentleman's um, testimony, is has anyone on this panel been homeless? Has anybody experienced a, a situation of being homeless for more than 24 hours? And is anyone in the, on this panel, has anybody stayed in these family shelters for more than 24 hours and, and experienced it the way that the homeless people have to experience it? I think that's the way it needs to be done. I challenge all of you, including Jean, because I think Jean would take this, a week. One week in the homeless shelter for every single one of you. I might add more for you, June, because I saw you on that video and you were, you were taking things just like Doug said. So the bottom line is I challenge you each to this because my sense is that the answer to my question will probably be no. So I'll let you answer it if you want to answer it. But I do offer a challenge to each one of you. Spend one week in the shelter. Spend one week without your money, without your ID. You spend one week the same way that everybody else spends a week, and then you will see how difficult it is. So, thank you very much. Yay! <laughs>
Uh, the way we're moving and the way we have moved for the past 20 plus years is for everybody to move in the same direction, to climb that steep hill. Not everybody wants to climb that steep hill. Not everybody finds that very fun or attractive. It's like if you don't have a type A personality, you don't belong. You're houseless. You're homeless. That's what's happening right now. If you don't foot the bill or, or march to the beat of that drum, you're out. You're out because of the economic system, because of the low diversity over here, low tolerance over here. We tried to get bicycles going on. Couldn't even do that. You know how much rules and regulations there are for housing you folks? No. All these federal guidelines that we can't do this, we can't do that. We forget we are Hawaii. Okay, ma'am. We forget All that right. Hawaiians specifically lived in grass huts, and now they're living on sidewalks. Thank you. Can I uh, add a comment? Sure. Along the lines of tax incentives, I had a conversation with uh, my father. He's a state senator, Willis Brown, he's actually here in the audience. <laughs> Yesterday we were chatting about solutions, and one idea that he, he brought up was providing tax credits to homeowners who are willing to rent out rooms to the homeless. And that's one solution that he is committed to introduce legislation next, uh, next session. And you know, I, I hope Good. the legislature supports and, 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 and you know, passes that bill. I'd like to kind of follow up on, the, on both those responses. My name, Ted, a little bit closer. My, my name is Ted Miller. I'm an ex-urban planner. I've worked in housing issues for the past 17 years. I've been a commercial uh, multifamily <coughs> broker. Uh, just a couple of uh, statistics to set up my question. Uh, the states with the highest rates of homelessness are Hawaii, New York, and California. The states with the uh, greatest affordability problems are Hawaii, New York, right. and California. Thank you. The average rent in in uh, Honolulu today for an apartment is roughly $22,000 a year plus utilities. The per capita income is roughly $30,000 a year. Those two numbers are converging. That's a recipe for dramatic levels of homelessness. Yeah. Of roughly one third of the, uh, of the uh, affordability problem we have is due to the fact that we're on an island. The remainder is due largely to the Land use, zoning, and development decisions made by uh, the Public city and county of Honolulu over the past 20 to 30 years. There we go. And I'd like, I could sit here and actually rattle off numerous policy changes that would make a significant difference in the private sector's ability to provide affordable housing. When I, don't, I don't mean subsidized housing. I mean housing that's affordable to local people. But I'd like to know what kind of new policies you're working on right now to do that same thing. Very good question. Thank you. I have a, just a brief comment on that, and that is um, we'll be bringing that up at City Council to discuss this with our City Council members. Hi, gentlemen. Um, I want to commend you all for being here this evening. I know this is, kind of feels like you're being grilled a little bit. Uh, but I think you know, one of the things that we've known for a long time here in Hawaii is that families have had to double up, triple up. You've got multiple generations living in households, not because they want to, but because they have to. We've seen this, we've known this for a long time. We knew this problem was coming, okay? It wasn't like it just jumped up one day and bit us right. out of nowhere, right. okay? And the problem is that we're, today we're being reactive to a problem that we knew was coming, but it's gotten so bad now that we have no choice but to respond, right. you know? It isn't like, okay, one day we just woke up and said, okay, here we are, we got a big homeless problem. We knew this was going to be here. But my challenge is, is why weren't we doing something about this 10 years ago? Right. Because, you know, this continuum of, of where we're going in terms of what we're able to earn versus what we have to pay to live here, that rule isn't changing. Okay, that statistic is going to continue to get worse 
and worse and worse. Okay, that means we've got to make some serious and profound changes to the way we do business here in the state today. Okay, um, that means policies have to change. Have to change. That means the ability to develop places and develop new properties that people can afford to buy or to rent need to be the priority. It needs to be priority number one. Yep. What we've got going in Kakaako today is a crime. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. We're building multi-million dollar properties for people who can't even live here. Okay. These properties aren't going to be bought by us. They're going to be bought by people in California. They're going to be bought by people in Asia. We can't afford them. Can anybody here afford them? No. no. Okay. So, what we need to do is really go back and reassess the way HCDA makes decisions about what right. kind of properties are going to be developed here in Kakaako. The people who live in Kakaako want to, want to have a way of life that they've enjoyed over the years. That's the way of that's the way they want to live their lives. This does not facilitate that. Okay. So we really have to go back and take a look at the way we make decisions about and the process that we're utilizing to build these structures. And, I, and to tell me that developers have to build six million dollar properties in order to make a profit, no way, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was an investment banker, I know what it takes and I also know that they pad the books when they build these projects. There's a lot of profit built into them when they do their estimates. I know that for a fact, because I used to do this kind of work too.